I, I want to take on a topic today that uh, I, I will have to tell you over the last 20, 25 years, this is the, the bane of the existence for business owners and leaders and entrepreneurs is hiring that first or second salesperson. And then the other side of it is how do you fire them if they're not working out? What do you do and all that? So today I want to, I'm going to split this up. This is one of the hardest presentations I've had to put together because there's just so much content. It's so complex just on the hiring side. But what I want to cover today and then in our topic next, uh, next month is how do you hire and fire your first and every salesperson, your first and every salesperson part one. And so, um, let me give you a quick overview where we're going to go, the roadmap. And again, I'm going to go really fast and I've got a lot on each slide. And so uh, listen fast, write fast and uh, we'll go. But uh, I want to talk about what's the objective? What are we trying to accomplish with a business? That's that core slide I'll go through. And then the sales hire challenge and, and how it is the greatest nightmare, highest risk decision and all that. Uh, for those of you that have never heard me speak before, don't know my background, I'll give you a little bit of flavor focused on the sales perspective today, um, because I really want you to be comfortable as I give you things that are counterintuitive and I share with you uh, things that will go opposite to what you've been told and sold or what you might even be doing. I need you to know uh, how I validated and proved this all over the world, these perspectives. I want to talk about the sales hire problem. I want to talk about the impact of that problem. I want to talk about the typical ways that business owners, leaders, small companies try and solve their sales hire mistake and why those don't work. And I want to get into the root cause. So, so what can we go fix? Because the typical solutions really treat the symptoms and they never solve the root cause. And you stay in the spin cycle, which doesn't help anybody. Uh, the next month, I'm going to talk about uh, how do you fire? How do you let them go? In many cases, it's going to be really opposite of what you expect. Um, and I'm going to talk through that because allowing a non-performer to linger or be part of your company is incredibly damaging. At 345, I'll do a hard stop. If you need to go, that's fine. Uh, I do want to share with you, we've got two really amazing promotions. Heather's making me give this stuff away for free. So I'm going to talk to her later about this. But anyway, stay with us. We'll talk through that because we're now no excuses. If your money tight and time starred, uh, we've got now platforms and programs to help you transform your business and be more, much more successful. I will stay on to do Q&A because I know there are going Going to be questions today. There's going to be ahas and, hey, Ken, how do you do this? Help us out. And I'll stay on and talk with you through that for a while. So welcome aboard. Big group today. I'm excited and let's uh, let's get right into it. So, all uh, right. Uh, why does that show up? Let me move that. Okay. So why are we here? Well, we're here because most businesses are trying to track and try to have incremental improvement top line, and they're ending up burning uh, resources, burning through people, salespeople to get there. And what do they end up? Years go by and they make a little bit of profit and they're on that treadmill we want to get off of. So in this case, what we're going to focus on today is how do you generate the most sales using the fewest salespeople? And then how can you use the roadmap, the book, the content, all those things that we've got to allow you to get here? What is here? Well, it's faster growth, higher growth, and fewer expenses. And it's, and it's this section in here, all that green is serious money. It's more capital, it's more cash flow, it's it's business wealth. And that should be the objective of what you're trying to do. At breakfast today, we were talking about, um, you know what, if you want to be incremental, if you want to be more better, if you if you just want to um, add more clients, then you know what, I, I'm not the one to talk to. That's not uh, my value proposition, my role in the work I do. I want to get you up here. I want to get you to an optimized state. That's the greatest results using the fewest resources. And so um, how do I get to uh, page down? All right. Real quick background, just so you know where I'm coming from, who I am, what I do. Um, in 40 years, but really the last 25 years, I've designed, transformed, 
turbocharged over a thousand sales organizations around the world, close to 40 countries. I got to expand on that because that's not just hiring people. That's not putting salespeople in place. That's not just using translators to hire sales teams, sales VPs, sales people. It's actually uh, doing all parts of the sales organization, which is everything from uh, culture to compensation process to people, technology to tools, measurement to metrics. And so um, my background is looking at things holistically as a system and then designing that system for maximum performance using minimum resources help small and large companies hire close to 10,000 salespeople. Um, that in itself is very important because it's the scale that you've got to go through to produce. You've got to have the tools and processes to do that. And I'm maybe most proud of this fact right here. I've deprogrammed several thousand salespeople. Real important point. You're, you're going to interview, you're going to hire. You may even have people on board today, salespeople that are, are actually pro, misprogrammed. They, they, they've been taught or told, they've been trained uh, in old school sales, um, handling objections, closing. Some of these things are, are really stale. And I'll explain why down the road. But uh, a lot of that training actually will work against you today and working against your salesperson being optimized. Uh, so we have to deprogram them. And people that are in my program, my ramp program, especially, they, they learn that themselves or their salespeople stop making sales calls. Um, that right there is kind of mind blowing. Uh, real quick, my last role that I had in a public company, I was actually an EVP of sales over a three year period. This was a public software sales, MicroMuse, Muse, the, uh, the ticker symbol. Uh, I, I led the group from two and a half million to 36 million in about two and a half years, under three years. And this is important. I gave out 17 offer letters to build the sales team, 15 accepted. Now, what's important in there is that's an 88% conversion rate. That is completely opposite to how most people are in hiring salespeople. They give out about five or six offer letters and they get one in return. That's not how you want to operate. And I'll talk about that later. How do you make sure that when you give out an offer letter, you get an acceptance and you know before you do that? Um, our team won 96%. That's 48 out of 50 major contracts over a three-year period in Cutthroat Software Sales, CA, Tivoli, HP, BMC, Harris, Tivoli. Those are phenomenal statistics. Well, where does that come from? Well, it starts with hiring the best people possible. And I'm going to give you some, uh, uh, some strategies and also some tips on how to do that. And more importantly, because once you hire them, that's one thing, but retaining people today is even more challenging. Uh, over a three-year period, I had 0% unplanned turnover, 5% planned. You got to split your turnover. You got to look at it both sides. Unplanned means you're losing a talent. Planned means you got to turn somebody that's a non-performer. The industry average is 40%. So I hope you appreciate those numbers. I give you that to give you perspective of how to play the game at levels that most people would never imagine. The great business challenge. And here's the issue. Without new sales, nothing else about your business matters. And, and, and let me stop there for a second. Without new sales, nothing else about your business matters. And the point being is too many people are so focused on their product, their service, their client experience, uh, their offices, their, their just stuff that's not important. At the end of the day, everything, everything links back to is your business producing new, great, high quality sales of your perfect client profile? Everything you say and everything you do should be aligned back to, are you doing that or not? Are you doing it at a great clip? Are you optimized in doing that? So let's talk about the sales hire mistake problem. And I'm, I'm going to go through some statistics because this is really important to lay the foundation of, of what's at stake here. 98% of first sales hires fail and the second hire is rarely much better. That means your odds of hiring uh, your first salesperson and them working out are stacked against you. It, it's, 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 it's this, the numbers are staggering. Um, but there's reasons why, and I'll talk about that. Nine out of 10 salespeople never cover their full cost, even if they meet sales quota. Two problems there. You, you don't have performing salespeople and your quotas are probably wrong. Only one salesperson at 5,000 can clearly articulate the difference between simple selling and complex sales. If you're in business to business, B2B, you are 99% of the time in a complex sale. And most people, salespeople you're going to hire have simple sales training skills they're not set up for success. You shouldn't have hired them or you're going to have to develop them. 
uh, eight out of sales, 10, uh, eight out of 10 sales calls actually leave the prospect emotionally neutral or negative, even if they request your proposal, which is how the salesperson feels. Oh, it was a great meeting. Uh, they want a proposal and they want more information. They don't know it was a terrible call. Every salesperson describes their most recent sales call as great. If you ever ask a salesperson when they come back from a call, how, how was the meeting? Oh, it was great. It went longer than expected. That is not how you measure the quality of a call because you're making a sales call. That's the two problems right there. Only one in 2,500. Uh, when I was giving speeches 15, 20 years ago, I started this company. The, stat the statistics were kind of interesting. It was one in a thousand salespeople could uh, effectively manage. There were about five phases to a complex sale back then. Today, there's seven phases. Only one uh, in 2,500 salespeople can actually literally articulate, let alone effectively manage all seven phases of a complex sale. I can unpack that more later if you want to know. Another sad statistic is Pareto's law, 20% of salespeople produce about 80% of their results. So why do you have those other salespeople? What's the mistake? What's the problem? And all that. So what's the impact? So those are the statistics that tell you kind of the lay of the land, but but now, what does that mean? Well, here's what this means. It's so horrific. It's just one wrong sales hire can burn through the profits of a small business. And in some cases, actually put that company out of business because there's no money. There's no working capital. There's no cash on hand. Um, and part of the challenge is that um, small companies, small, uh, business leaders with small firms, they make the salesperson the center of the universe. They make the salesperson the center of the model now that means your success of your business is resting on the shoulders of somebody who might be incompetent. That's that's not a good foundation. That's not a good model. Um, I can talk about that in more detail later. They should not be at the center of the model, uh, even though sales is so critical. See, that's the misnomer there. Can if, if if sales is so critical, and salespeople re create my sales, then how do I square that round hole? Well, they don't create your sales. The system does. They play a role in the creation or conversion of the demand. Very important if you want to put that in your notes. The wrong sales hire creates horrible stress on the owner leader. I've walked into many environments where it was just toxic, even with sales leadership, salespeople, missing their numbers, quarterly death march becomes the, the quarterly nightmare. Um, it, it's a horrific, horrific thing. Uh, small businesses, and here's the financial damage, small businesses will miss out on hundreds of thousands to several million a year in lost deals and revenue. Um, that That's just so damaging. And the years that will be lost, uh, it, for young entrepreneurs and, and, and people getting into business, they don't think in terms of years, but uh, more seasoned or, and older uh, folks, uh, they've got to worry. They, they have to worry about the time for two reasons. One of them is at some point in time, they want to retire. But number two, your windows of opportunity close. If, if you're spending years trying to get traction and trying to solve a fundamental marketplace problem, it could go away within a year or two because other competitors have stepped in. Bad salespeople will destroy a company's brand for years. In complex sales, if you've got poor salespeople on accounts, they can poison those accounts because they didn't buy from you or you destroyed the brand for years. The average is five to seven years, what we call uh, brand damage inside of an account until that account rotates through people. Poor sales will negatively impact, even sabotage other functions. So as, as uh, one of my clients said one time, he loved this line that I said, I go, sales is the victim of poor marketing. Operations and delivery is the victim of poor sales. What I mean by that is uh, if, if you don't make the right sales, if you have salespeople who don't produce and don't bring in that perfect client profile that's going to manage their responsibilities, and if you don't bring in the best of the best to work with, you're going to be trying to meet expectations. You're trying to make uh, clients happy. You're, you're trying to do things from the operations and delivery side that are you're you're literally set up for failure, not success. That could start back with that, that poor sales hire, that mistake in that sales hire. And, and so many teams out there, I want to land on this point for a little bit. So many sales teams are under such pressure to make numbers that they will optimize or hit their targets and sub-optimize the other functions. That's a disaster, especially in systems thinking and enterprise management. So that's these are the damages. 
well, how do people try to fix this? How do managers, leaders, owners, entrepreneurs try to fix this? These are the typical strategies. There's a lot, but but here's some of it. They, they hire uh, one and they pray. Oh my gosh, I, I'm hiring this salesperson. I'm so excited. I'm really hopeful. Um, and I, when I found this graphic, I thought this was perfect. This is a guy that just uh, down here, he just hired his first salesperson. And he's now praying to, I guess, the sales gods or whatever. <laughs> Not go religious here. But he's praying that it's going to work out. And, and again, 98% of the time it doesn't. And so then what happens? We hire many and we hope. This right here, this bullet is the brokerage industry, the insurance industry, uh, different industries. That they just hire swaths of people and then they let God sort them out. Well, again, that's not a great model, um, but they're following that mantra of sales is a numbers game. Sales hiring then becomes a numbers game. Completely flawed strategy. Now, small companies can't even do that because the expense of hiring and the time and all that. So that's not a good strategy for small companies. And it's a terrible strategy for large companies, but they do it just because they're so poor at hiring. The next one is, and, and this is the one that uh, I've had many late night phone calls and emails with CEOs and business owners to say, you got a problem and you're going to have to fix it. So stop hiring the wrong people and living with it and settling and hoping that they're going to pay for themselves. That's the language I get. Oh, Ken, if they, if they just sign a deal, they've been here nine months. If they just sign something, you know, they'll, they'll pay for themselves. Well, the problem is they're probably not. And the fact is you are paying them and you're paying them a lot of money. Um, as you read in my book that when you had a salesperson, you had eight categories of costs. And, and one of those categories is their sales expenses, the pursuit costs, the support costs, the management layers and costs. And so uh, they're eventually hoping they're going to sell a deal and pay for themselves. But that's not a good return. And that means you've got other issues. I, I do want to qualify this, that in most cases, um, a sales hire isn't set up for success. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack that more, but they're not set up for success. So you could hire the right person and then be failing, but you're still living with it. You're not fixing the root cause. And so the classic becomes hire and fire, rinse and repeat, just going through the cycles. And at some point, you, you, you've just got to end it. But here's the worst idea of all. This is the worst mistake, is believing that if we offer a lot of money if we offer uh, high base salaries that we're going to attract and even retain top sales talent. Um, I'm going to talk later uh, about the fact, you know what, let me do it now, just so I don't forget. Back to that soft public software company that I ran, um, 90, 80, 90% of the salespeople I hired actually took a cut in pay. I lowered their base salaries. And, and that's an important point. I'll talk about that later. but. In, in many cases, if you're paying people, if you're trying to use high salaries to attract people, you're already set up for failure because many reasons behind it. But one of them is they'll go to the next highest bidder. They might work for you for six months. Somebody offers them some, some more money. They're gone. That That's now going to put you back at rinse and repeat. So don't try to play the game. Don't try to win the game with money. None of these approaches actually ever solve the root cause. Now, let me go over here and, and, and talk about and this is this is important because why why do we fail at hiring uh, great salespeople? Why do we fail? Why, why are the statistics so bad? Why are the odds so stacked against us as leaders and owners and entrepreneurs? Well, here's where it starts. Your company and and and. When I say you're, I'm, I'm talking to pretty much everybody out there. Your company doesn't actually attract real or proven sales talent. This is where the game begins. You've got to have a company, and this is really a marketing and sales issue, but you've got to be building a company that attracts top talent. That doesn't mean you have to be a Google or an Amazon or a super large company, but you've got to create a business. You've got to create a vibe. You've got to create a culture where the best talent wants to come work for you. If you don't attract top talent, you can't hire top talent. Let me stop on that point because it's so important. If you don't attract top talent, you can't hire top talent. So it's very important. I'm going to talk about what do you do here? How do you fix this? How do you attract that top talent? But it's so critical uh, where it starts. And I talk in the book, uh, you actually use a story of a, a, of a circus dog trainer and, and the amazing tricks that they could do. And I talk about what was his secret? What was his strategy 
uh, to actually uh, perform the dogs to perform at such a level. So this one over here, confusing salespeople with sales talent. In the book, in chapter 15, I talk about optimizing talent. I really explain the difference between what is an employee and what is talent. And in too many cases, we're not clear on this, uh, that what is a salesperson versus a sales talent. And, and here's why. And I'm, I'm going to give people grace here because it's important. Only 6% of you out there that are running companies today have a, an extensive sales background. Only 6% have a marketing background. In most cases, business owners, leaders, even entrepreneurs come from other areas such as uh, law, operations, technology, things like that. And so um, this part right here is unless you've had extensive experience in the sales world, the sales models, the sales environments, it's not going to be easy or clear for you to understand well, what's actually a sales talent. And, and so this is really important because that then determines what do you actually or who are you actually hiring? Another one, and this is really important for some of you that are uh, on the call today, you might have retail or you might have a transaction oriented sales environment. You've got to be absolutely clear over here that your sales role that you're hiring to is in alignment with the type of people you're talking to. Now, many of you have heard the terms, the, the characterization. I don't like these, but I'm going to use them because they're popular. But um, you've heard the farmer and hunter uh, up here. Uh, I'll add another one to gather, but there's the farmer who kind of cultivates the accounts and the relationships, the hunter that goes out, the gunslinger that shoots what they can kill. The gatherer is more that uh, uh, person going through the fields, trying to look for leads, trying to find people. And there's and these aren't the roles I like to talk about uh, because they're not uh, clear, but the, but the roles can be, are they account manager? Are they a door opener? Are they focused on conversions? What is the number one role you expect that person to play? One of the challenges I've got in the tech world with clients, especially those that are, that are run by uh, cultures from other countries, is they, they want to hire these salespeople to be uh, hunters and um, uh, in the way that they're both doing all the prospecting and they're doing all the closing. Uh, the problem there is in complex sale, if people are working on trying to open doors, they're not going to spend a lot of time on converting the opportunities, vice versa. In most cases, in complex sales, once you're in the opportunities, you don't have time to go do cold calling and, and, and trying to network and all that. And so you've got to uh, split these up uh, between the different roles, but you've got to prioritize what's the number one role you need. Is it a door opener? Is it an account relationship developer? Is it somebody that's going to uh, be a converter? What, what are you looking for? All right, here's another one. And this, this one might be, if you don't learn anything else from me today, this one is super important. Believing or following stale sales philosophies. There's a lot of uh, beliefs and, and, and philosophies that, that worked last century in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It still kind of work today, and that's, that's where the flaws are. But this first one, sales is a numbers game. Um, a lot of sales managers are losing their jobs today because of performance issues. And I can draw it back to in most cases because this is their core philosophy. What I mean by that for some of you that are, aren't, uh, uh, haven't heard this concept before, haven't heard this term, and if you ever do, please run. Sales is a numbers game means I just need to run through as many opportunities as I can until I find an opportunity or a deal or I sell something. The characterization of this is even a blind squirrel can find a nut on occasion. I hope you're not looking for nuts or hiring nuts, but, but sales is actually not a numbers game. It's a ratio game. Now, in the beginning, when you're first starting a business, when you're first running a business, sales is a numbers game where you're trying to uh, understand how many meetings and calls and prospects does it take to convert, to get that client. And then at some point in time, um, you've got to start to see it as a ratio. It, 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 I work this many opportunities. How many of them can I convert? Over time, the key here is sales is a numbers game. You want to identify what your ratio is. Remember, I shared with you earlier, 96% win conversion rate, 48 out of 50 deals. You want to see what those numbers are, and then you want to start to um, work on that ratio that you're improving. Because if you can increase the uh, ratio, then you don't need more salespeople, and you don't need to spend more money on sales. You just need to stop losing less. Um, 
This one is very interesting. And, and you can use this one when you're actually hiring and talking to salespeople. And here's how I do it. And I recommend put this in your notes. So you're interviewing a salesperson, a potential person to be uh, on your team and just look at them and say, what is your core sales philosophy? Now, I'm going to go ahead and warn you that you might have some people get up and run and leave skid marks in the parking lot because they have no clue what you're talking about. Those aren't the people you want to hire. But in many cases, you're going to get people eventually to get around to, well, sales is just how many people you can talk to, how many proposals I can get out, how many meetings I can have. If you start to listen to that uh, and hear that, then red flags should go up because that's going to start to tell you they're old school, old thinking, old model. And they basically are going to burn a lot of your resources trying to produce sales. Here's the next one. Selling is selling. That, that's a, a classic philosophy and um, still believe today, and it's the, uh, I hate to even, I cringe whenever I hear this, um, they're so good, they could sell ice to Eskimos. Oh my God, uh, I, I just almost gagged. First of all, Eskimos don't need ice, so why are you even selling them? That's the ethics issue. But the fact is, no, there are different environments, and let me share those with you real quick. There's three sales environments. There's a simple sales, and I talk about this in the book, so make sure you read this in chapter 10. There's simple sales, simple selling transactions, selling one step, one buyer, one belief system, one set of emotions. Complex sales is multiple steps, multiple buyers, multiple decisions, multiple emotional factors. Um, they are not the same. And the strategies that can work in selling, hard closing, some of those other classic old strategies, handling objections, uh, uh, people buy from people they like, those don't work at all in complex, large ticket enterprise type selling. So you've got to know the difference here. Selling is not selling. That's something not only do I fix, but I have to save a lot of salespeople many times because they've gotten in the door as a transaction salesperson and now they're in a complex sales environment and they're drowning and the sales management and the leadership can't understand why. This is the problem right here. Uh, more activities lead to more sales. This is the classic. If you're just really busy, you're going to get deals back to the blind score funds and that. All right. So here's another mistake. A root cause is we are not actually prepared to interview proven sales talent. And we look at too many things. I'll talk about that. But uh, the difference is we look at sales skills, not sales competencies. Real quick, a competency is a cluster of skills. And this goes for any any hire that you're making. Uh, today, the world is about competencies. It's no longer skills. Not clo uh, totally clear on the three sales environments. I've talked about that. Uh, your sales compensation is designed to pay for work, not for performance. Heather loves this one because that's a fundamental flaw. You're overpaying in the base and you're underpaying in the performance in the package. Real quick, I'll just tell you, I got to give you this one. Uh, if you're in an interview and the salesperson is really, or the candidate is really focused on the base salary and the compensation, they don't ask questions or understand how the package works, let them go. Let walk away in the interview. Uh, you want to offer too much money to attract talent. Your enterprise is not sales ready. I'm going to talk about that. Attraction strategies don't filter non-talent. This one's interesting because as you start to attract, you start to talk to uh, potential candidates that could fill the right role, might have the right competencies, and somebody that could be a great fit and produce those revenues, those millions that you need. Um, you've got to filter them too. You've got to find ways to sort through quickly. You can't spend a lot of time in a lot of interviews trying to look through and find. Uh, you should only spend time in interviews with candidates that fit. That's that key right there. Uh, interview process does not glean real talent back to competencies. Uh, and here's a classic, and this is just embarrassing, but you wouldn't believe how many meetings I'm in. Interview meetings where afterwards I talk to the CEO and they go, well, it says here on their resume. And I go, you believe that? You believe what's on their resume? Their resumes are the uh, greatest form of false advertising that's out there today. Beware, be warned. Uh, most resumes don't have everything and they're stale. Uh, biggest mistake, again, salespeople at the center of your model. That's set up for failure. It can't be. So now let's talk about what's a superior approach? How do you, how do you fix this? How do you make sure that you're ready you're attracting and, and you can make sure you bring in that uh, great sales hire because if you get this right, it can be amazing. What it can do for your company, uh, what it can do for morale, what it can do for your brand, it, it's just so incredible. 
but the odds are so stacked against you and then we've got to get it right. So the first thing, um, and this is where use my book, use my materials. We'll talk more about the free, free things for you to not make these mistakes because they're so expensive. Um, but that uh, it's laid out in the roadmap and where we want to start is become organizationally ready. There's a reason in the book that I talk about marketing and sales is not till phase three. And when we really start adding salespeople, start spending money on marketing, it's not an investment in, in either the spend in marketing or the, uh, or the salespeople. It's a waste because we're not organizationally ready. And that means that we haven't worked through phase one. We haven't worked through phase two. We were in a, uh, Heather and I were in a breakfast conversation today talking about this is if you really want to optimize your growth using minimum resources, you've got to be ready for the talent. You've got to be ready for the market. You've got to be ready for your competition. And so that's phase one is revenue ready. Phase two, uh, market ready. Um, what you're trying to do here, what, what you want to accomplish is where your business, your enterprise is creating demand. You're not marketing and selling. You're not chasing. You're not pushing your products and services. You're actually chasing demand. All right, you're creating demand. All right, uh, implement now the uh, Chapter 10 sales conversion system. You want to have a system in place. When you bring that individual in, you either want to be building this or have it in place where they play a role in the conversion. They're not owning and doing everything about the sales conversion. That won't scale. That's not repeatable. It's not predictable. It's not forecastable. Uh, now, down here, again, and this is one that's really critical. Talent, sales talent will not be managed. And, and you're finding that today. I hear the millennials and the X generation and all that kind of stuff. No. Some of these people in different generations just don't want to be managed. They don't need to be managed. They do want to be led. They do want structure. They do uh, want to operate in a system, but they don't want to be managed. And so it's very important if you don't have an a extensive background in sales, sales leadership and all that, you've got to work to get this layer because the last thing you want to do is suffocate your salespeople with, well, how many calls did you make today? How many meetings? How many proposals went out? Th those are uh, sales talent will run from you if you approach it as a sales management or I call it a sales mangler. Um, attract top sales talent. I talk about this in the book. So go do this. Use the framework. The framework is how to attract, acclimate, and develop and care for talent at all levels of your company. Uh, make sure to read that chapter, listen to that chapter. I got people listen and read and, and all that kind of stuff. Sales talent sourcing in chapter 15 on the website, competition. I'll talk a little bit more about that in tips in just a minute. Interviewing, offering, and negotiating. Um, in your interviewing should all be leading to a mutual offer. You want them to work for you and, and they want to work for you. In your negotiating, um, give things up and get returned, but, but see how your salesperson actually negotiates. So here's what uh, I want to share this with you. Uh, I love interviewing salespeople because it shows their sales skills. Uh, can they negotiate? Can they uh, manage resistance issues? Uh, can they uh, manage and talk through fundamental marketplace problems, talk about business models? Are they aspirational? I use some other things uh, in behavioral-based interviewing to ferret out who's a real talent, who's not. But uh, you want to be looking for sales skills in their negotiating because they're going to be negotiating deals for you and contracts. And if, if they're terrible in the interview, they're not going to be any better in, in the sales role. Okay, this last one on this one is this in this holistic approach, I'm going to give you some hard tips. Uh, design a kick-ass compensation development care system. Um, you've got to create a compensation package, a care package that's far beyond what they would earn for their base salary. Matter of fact, in most cases, it needs to be about two to one, three to one ratio. In other words, the top end of the package I'll go back. Let me share with you my team, that software sales team. The average salary I was paying was between eighty and hundred thousand. Their upside, uh, what's called OTE on target earnings, was about three hundred fifty thousand. I had several earn million uh, over a million a year, but the OTE package was about three to one, uh, and that's what I recommend down here in designing your compensation. Make sure it's a package, and here's the key. They don't get paid till the company gets paid. In other words, you want to pay for performance. You want to make sure all the carrots are out there. My philosophy in leadership, not management, is I use a predominantly uh, carrot approach, not a stick approach. A stick approach is you, you go after people, attack people, wear people out, ask questions, play 21 
type questions. That, that's old school. I see it a lot in sales management. It, it turns people off. You want a carrot system where all kinds of things are out there, all kinds of mechanisms, um, no governors. You want to make sure that uh, you've got triggers, you've got uh, hierarchies and escalators and things like that. Uh, you want your people, and this is going to be counterintuitive, you want your people to become rich in sales. And I've had a lot of talks with CEOs and people go, oh, Kent, oh my God, you're, you're paying your salespeople a million dollars a year. I said, yeah, they, they bring in 10, 15 million. I would need 10 salespeople to do that. I save a fortune by paying them a million. And it, and it takes a while to, for people to get that. But again, I say it because this compensation, the package is designed that if they produce for the company, they're highly rewarded. Um, because I don't want to spend a lot of time in HR or recruiting and all that. Uh, I want to spend time focused on producing next level results. So if I can get people that are highly motivated, knowing that there, there's all kinds of accelerators to make money, if they perform, reward performance, not pay for work, if they do, then they're going to be wildly successful and so will my company. All right, let's go into quick tips. I got a few minutes left here. I want to give you some things you can go do right now. So here's one of them that's interesting. Hiring sales talent is all about timing, but it's not your timing. It's their timing. Sales talent doesn't need a home. Sales talent is, is locked in somewhere. They're probably making a heck of a salary. Uh, they're doing really well. You're going to have to prime away. In many cases, you're going to have to steal them. Uh, everyone I hired, I had to go after them. I use, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but I use recruiters to go find the talent and then I would, I would uh, convert them over. But you always want to be recruiting because when you need them, they not, might not be available and you've got to get the timing right. So you want to be recruiting uh, and talking to people and find out who's competent, who's got skills. Uh, would they ever consider leaving? Are they connected with golden handcuffs? You, you got to kind of understand all this because in many cases, and we're coming up in November, December. These are good times for hiring because if people didn't get their bonuses or they've got them or they're, that once their year ends over, they're going to be looking. Um, it's usually year in that there's a lot of change. You want to take advantage of that. Uh, advertise on your, on your website. I, a lot of companies tell me that they're hiring and they need a, a top caliber salesperson. I said, where's that on your website? Where's that on your, um, your page that shows that? Uh, if I if I go to your website, because a candidate or a recruiter that you're working with, they're gonna, first thing they're going to do is go to your website. Um, it's okay to have on there, even if you have a sales team to have on there that you're recruiting. They know it. Uh, it's not something you're trying to hide. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, we use not just job descriptions. We use a tool I call Job Designs that's available in our programs. Uh, and a job description is to both attract and filter talent. A job design is now what do you do that you're here? What does your day look like? How are you measured? How are you rewarded? Uh, what are the roles, responsibilities? What are the deliverables? Not the activities, but the actual production deliverables. That right there is a game changer. And you should talk about that in the interview process is here's how we measure production. We don't measure it by number of meetings, number of calls, number of proposals. That's old school. We measure it by, and then you fill in the blank. Here are the things we look for and we measure. Here's another one that's really interesting is that um, forget personality tests. There's so much emphasis today on these personality tests. And I have to tell you, uh, it's a data point of about eight data points. What you should be really looking for is competencies, these clusters of skill sets, and, and prove them, again, using behavioral-based interview techniques to understand do these people really have these competencies because competencies are transferable. What's on the resume is usually a lie and isn't. Um, in many cases, top performing salespeople, salespeople that made their numbers, salesperson of the year, they were part of a team or they were a success victim, meaning they were part of a superior product or a new rollout or something. They didn't do the work. Uh, and so be careful with that and resumes, pay competitive salaries, ridiculous incentives. Okay, here's another one I want to share with you and I'm going to wrap it up here is references. Do the references checks and don't turn that over to recruiters. Don't turn that over to somebody on your team in HR. You call the references and here's what you ask. So Sally used to work for you. Uh, you were their manager or you were their boss. What development item did you have them working on? What skill or competency did you have them working on to improve their performance? That question when asked properly will give you 
phenomenal insights to what you're potentially hiring. Last thing is don't believe anything on the resume. Um, all right, so uh, let me hard stop there. If you got to go, I understand, but I want to share with you. So how do you do this? How do you get this? How do you optimize your sales, revenue, and profits? How do you do it in the fastest, smartest, best, and cheapest way? Because I, you know what? I, I, I run a business and we got to be frugal. We got to be tight, but we got to be smart. We got to put these things in place. Well, the first thing is try not to do this on your own. You don't have the time. You don't have the expertise. Lean on us and, and, and use us. And here's how to do it. The first thing is go to our, sign up for our blogs. Here's one right here that you've got to get. If you don't have, haven't read this, you shouldn't be hiring. Business killing mistake number 14. Your biggest sales problem is not your sales people. And I talk about the parts around the salesperson for hiring and once they're on board. These are the things I talk about that you've got to have in place to set them up for success. Most salespeople, I'll go back to that horrific number, 98% fail. A lot of it is because they're not set up for success. They're set up for failure or sub-optimization. We do a webinar every month. I think we're going to do another one in a couple of weeks. I've had a request by somebody on the call today. They want to do a, a, a private webinar, and I think we might open that up to the public, but we do one every month. The next month is how do you fire these people? So now you've got a problem. You've got a sales hire. It's not working out. What do you do? I'm going to give you strategies, tactics, uh, ways to measure uh, what you can do, what they should do, all those kinds of things. I've helped hire and fire thousands. So I'll walk you through uh, how to manage it properly because people today freak out. They do it wrong. Um, I, yeah, I, I could almost do that seminar right now. Uh, public workshops. We do public workshops on occasion. Make sure to come to those because you get a lot of information for free. Here, here's the exciting news. Here's something I want to share with you. We now have, we've been working on this for almost a year. We now have um, a, a now an online learning platform uh, where there are no excuses. If you don't have much budget, you don't have much time, uh, you can learn on your own. You can learn at the office. Um, you can increase the sales, bring more value to the company. And it's, uh, let me give you some more details. Here is the platform and you get all of these things. You get access to this webinar that's going to be private on YouTube. You get access to the webinars, the content, all the blogs, uh, worksheets, all that. Here are about 15 to 20 different things that allow us to augment through our E2M learning platform uh, what you get in our a high intensity ramp program, which you get um, in a, a small group, you get the E2M learning platform included, which is really powerful. But I want to share with you what's really important to you is right now, we have the first module up. It's called Secrets to Business Career Success. It's part of chapter one in the book. It's the aha I discovered working with thousands of folks in our program. What was it? What, what was it? How they thought, how they spoke, how they acted that separated them up to become these superstars and super performers. That module is $200 and we're going to offer it for a few weeks now at $49. We've got people in the program. We've done beta. Uh, we've got great re, uh, uh, feedback, what they loved and all that kind of stuff. Some of you on here are, we're in the beta. We're now offering that. It's $49. This truly is transformational. It's going to help you develop a small business culture that is incredibly competitive and more important, helps you optimize your resources. From there, we've got the small groups we're forming, taking contracts and deposits. What we're doing, our promotion on there is if you join with a friend, uh, we'll lower the, the fee even more to get you involved. That can save you thousands of dollars a year. But again, now you're working in a group. You're working on an immersion uh, a day each month, and you're working an hour each week. And then you're also getting access to the uh, e-learning uh, and templates and tools. Here's the things over here that you're getting that you don't get in other small groups, all kinds of stuff. So there are no excuses. If, if you're truly trying to not just grow your company, build a better, better, bigger or better company, but if you want to optimize, make the most sales revenue and profits using the fewest resources, we have very uh, affordable platforms and programs, groups up to our high intensity type stuff. Uh, reach out, uh, talk to us. We'll package up something based on your budget, your time, and your needs. 